Muffled voices came from the other side of the door. It was late afternoon, and I was sitting on the toilet trying to take advantage of a rare relaxing moment since the large breakfast I had eaten. <laughs> <clears throat> Who's there? What are you boys doing there? Hello, do you hear me? Who's out there? The response instantly and completely cleared my colon. <laughs> This is the San Diego Sheriff Department, and you need to come out slowly with your hands where we can see them. Without hesitation, I complied. <laughs> <laughs> Moving cautiously through the bathroom door, hands in the air, time seemed stationary. The female officer came from behind me after inspecting the bathroom. Her two male colleagues were in front of me all of them with guns drawn and pointed in my direction. Seeing these massive weapons caused profuse droplets of sweat and a nervous seizure, I was afraid to breathe. There were more cops outside. They had my sons and their friends lined up against the wall. I've had a fear of the police from a very young age. My family and I lived in Negro communities in Vicksburg, Mississippi. In these Negro communities, there were no areas with white people or police stations. But sometimes there were white people passing through and the police did too, to protect us. My parents always told us that we should hide whenever we see policemen to try and stay away from them. They are the real criminals. One night at four years old, my siblings and I were sleeping over at my grandma Lucille's when a huge rock came crashing through the bedroom window. The voices of the white policemen woke me. They were questioning my parents and Grandma Lucille as if we had committed the crime ourselves. Trying to be invisible, I hid, raising the covers over my head. I was frightened about the rock, but the policemen scared me more. Their voices had nasty tones. They didn't sound kind or friendly, like the cops on TV. <laughs> my parents wanted to get us out of the South. The civil rights movement was just kicking up. Negroes were being forced into cramped communities. Negro men, women, and children were being lynched. My siblings and I remained in Vicksburg and lived with my grandma Annette when my parents went north to Illinois to find work and a safer place for us to live. In my grandma Annette's neighborhood, we rarely saw white faces unless, of course, they were on a floor model black and white TV, more white than black. <laughs> The closest thing to a black celebrity we saw on TV was Tarzan. He was African born and raised. <laughs> we wanted to be just like him, especially when he used his call of the wild to defeat any foe. Ah, 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 ah. My first scary venture outside of Grandma Nett's neighborhood was into white downtown. I'd been playing in Poison Oak my grandmother clutched me tightly as we walked through the clinic. I was petrified, not knowing what to expect and in awe of so much white all around me. Lots of white people dressed in white uniforms, white sheets, curtains, floors, walls, cotton balls, gauze, bandages. <laughs> Everywhere it was white, white, white. <laughs> When the nurses finished jerking and twisting my limbs, I smelled of sulfur-based salve and whatever was seeping from my rashes. And over half my body was wrapped in gauze. I still have cold, unfriendly, eerie flashbacks to that clinic when I see rolls of white gauze on the shelf at the drugstore. Later that year, on my Grandma Nett's birthday, November 22, 1963, President JFK was assassinated. We were sent home from school immediately. I had to walk home. It was quiet enough outside to hear the snowfall. The gravity of life for a little second grade colored girl in the deep south finally sunk in. The whole community was in mourning. And for weeks, we saw and heard at home from the adults, from neighbors, and from TV was the murder of our great white hope. Never mind that he looked like a fair-skinned colored man to me. 
At night, the adults stood on porches discussing what would happen next. Did you hear about the lynching? Did you hear about those beatings and hangings? I could hear them clearly as they talked about leaving and about protecting us children from the Southern whites or the KKK. Even as, young, as a young child, I knew it was serious. The adults used the porches as a meeting place when they needed to discuss something really important. We left the South. The very next summer, we moved to Illinois. It seemed like we never stopped moving. Next, it was Colorado and then Texas. Even though I didn't see as much violence in these states as in Mississippi, they each had their own brand of racism. Even in Illinois, the KKK burned crosses on lawns. We couldn't live in white neighborhoods in Colorado. In Texas, it was illegal and not safe for colored people to walk the streets at night. And I had seen places where there were still signs hung in front of businesses where blacks were not allowed. Despite never really escaping segregation and racism, my family's movement about the country gave me the freedom as an adult to go past invisible boundaries and settle into any community I chose for myself. Almost 40 years after leaving Mississippi, I'm standing in my own apartment, hands above my head, with a police officer's gun pointed at my face. Ma'am, we need to see your identification. Mind you, I'm standing in an old nightgown, and only an old nightgown. <laughs> Sir, why don't you just look at the, all the portraits hanging on the wall with me in them? <laughs> he insisted on seeing my ID anyway. But my purse was on the other side of the room, and I was afraid to move towards it. I asked him to hand it to me. I was careful to take my ID out without provoking him into shooting me as a suspected burglar in my own home. They were satisfied with my identification and laughed as if they hadn't just violated about a dozen of my rights. After filing a formal complaint with the county, I finally found out that the police were responding to a call made by a concerned citizen who just happened to be driving by and saw two white college-age guys climbing into my apartment. Obviously, I fit the description. <laughs> I would love to say the harassment ended there, but my son has been stopped and handcuffed in front of my house several times. My daughter-in-law stopped and cuffed at the trolley station, mistaken for another black person twice her size. Before we moved from the apartment, we were visited by the police at least once a month for complaints made by our upstairs neighbor about noise late at night. It was my son snoring. Or the kids playing hopscotch or tagging on the public sidewalk. In the South, the discrimination was literally spelled out on signs that said no niggas allowed. In the South Bay, racism is hidden behind the faces of real estate agents smiling while they're telling you the vacancy has been filled or behind badges of police officers saying, we've received a report. Transparent chains of covert racism shackled to me for over 50 years. I can't ignore it, be naively unaware of its existence. Well, at least sometimes the police officers are women. I guess some things have changed. Give it up for Miss Sylvia Nelson, everybody.